Hello everyone, welcome back to our lecture on chapter 12. This is Professor Droud, and let's get right into it today. Um, and we'll talk about the first objective, which is to recall a little bit from way back in the beginning, um, and state the general purpose of the nervous system using the terms receptors, integrating centers, and effectors. Um, the nervous system itself has three general functions, a sensory function, an interpretive function, and a motor function. Sensory nerves gather information from the inside the body or the external environment. The nerves then carry that information to the central nervous system or CNS. The nervous system uh, is then responsible for coordinating the body's response or the activities. It controls not only the maintenance of normal functions, but it also uh, controls the body's ability to cope with emergency situations. The receptor then receives information. The integrating center receives and processes the information from the receptor. And then the effector responds to the commands of the control center by either opposing or enhancing the stimulus. Okay, on to objective two. Uh, we'll talk about the two major subdivisions of the nervous system. The central nervous system, comprised of the brain and the spinal cord, enclosed in the cranium and the vertebral column, respectively and the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS. All other nervous system components, uh, aside from the brain and the spinal cord, and it's composed of nerves and ganglia. A nerve is a bundle of the nerve fibers, or axons, wrapped in fibrous connective tissue, and ganglion is a knot-like swelling in a nerve where the cell bodies, or the soma, of peripheral neurons are concentrated. Okay, let's talk about the peripheral nervous system, because the peripheral nervous system is functionally divided into sensory and motor divisions. Each of those divisions is further divided into somatic and visceral subdivisions. So the sensory or afferent division uh, carries signals from receptors to the central nervous system. This pathway informs the central nervous system of stimuli within the body and in the environment. The somatic or sensory division carries signals from receptors in the skin, muscles, bones, and joints, and the visceral sensory division carries signals from the viscera, the heart, lungs, stomach, and urinary bladder. The motor or efferent division carries signals from the central nervous system to the effectors, the glands, and the muscles that carry out the response. The somatic motor division carries signals to skeletal muscles, the output produces muscular contraction as well as somatic reflexes, which are the involuntary muscle contractions. The visceral motor division is also denoted or called the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system carries signals to the glands and the cardiac and the smooth muscle, which results in those involuntary responses, which are also called visceral reflexes. Okay. The autonomic nervous system, again, uh, it operates at the unconscious level, and it is further divided into two subdivisions. The sympathetic, uh, which tends to arouse the body for action. It accelerates the heartbeat uh, and increases respiration, and it inhibits digestive and urinary functions. Um, for muscular exertion uh, and for that fight or flight uh, response to emergencies. The parasympathetic division tends to have a calming effect. It slows the heart rate and uh, slows down breathing. It stimulates the digestive and urinary systems to do their job. And this is for metabolic physiologic homeostasis and just for overall regulatory processes. So this is how it's broken down. The central nervous system is made up of the brain and the spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system is made up of essentially everything else. It is uh, broken down further into the sensory and the motor divisions, which both have a visceral and a somatic uh, further subdivision. And then the visceral motor division or the, para or the um, autonomic ner nervous system uh, is also broken down into the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Okay, now let's talk about the nervous tissue cell, the neuron, and the functional classes of neurons. You have sensory or afferent neurons, which detect stimuli and transmit information about them towards the central nervous system. They can detect things like light, heat, pressure, and chemicals in the environment. Um, they begin in almost every organ in the body and they end in the central nervous system. 
Then you have things called interneurons or the integrating centers, and they lie entirely within the central nervous system and they connect the motor and the sensory pathways. About 90% of all neurons are integrating centers. They receive signals from many different neurons and they carry out the integrative functions by making decisions or responses. Um, about 90% of our neurons are interneurons and they lie in between the incoming sensory pathways and the outgoing motor pathways. And then the last are the motor or the efferent neurons. They send signals out to the muscles and the gland cells. These are the effectors. Um, a, a good thing to remember is that afferent is towards the central nervous system and efferent is away from the central nervous system. Okay, some universal properties of neurons. They are excitable. That means they respond to environmental changes called stimuli. They are conductive. That means they respond to stimuli by producing electrical signals that are quickly conducted or transmitted to other cells at distant locations. And they have the ability to do secretion. And when an electrical signal reaches the end of a nerve fiber, the cell will secrete a chemical called a neurotransmitter that will influence the next cell and keep that signal going. So here's what it looks like. Sensory or afferent neurons conduct signals from touch, let's say, to the central nervous system, the, where you find the integrating neurons or the interneurons, which are confined to the central nervous system. And then they process that signal and send out another signal to the motor neurons, the efferent neurons, to conduct those signals and to uh, affect the effectors like muscles or glands. Okay, now let's take a look at the uh, structure of a neuron. And the first thing uh, that I want you to look at is in yellow, it is the neurosoma or the cell body. It's the control center of the neuron. It has a single centrally located nucleus with a very large nucleolus. Um, the cytoplasm contains all the things you would expect, mitochondria, lysosomes, Golgi complex, inclusions, um, extensive rough ER, and cytoskeleton. Some of those inclusions are glycogen, lipid droplets, melanin, and lipofusin, uh, which is a pigment that's produced when lysosomes digest old organelles. Um, they're also sometimes called wear and tear granules because they're most abundant in the old neurons. Um, another thing is you'll find the cytoskeleton. It has a dense mesh of microtubules and neurofibrils, which are bundles of actin filaments, and it compartmentalizes uh, the rough ER into this dark staining chromatophilic substance. Um, there are no centrioles because neurons do not undergo mitosis. Uh, they are what, what you are born with, you essentially have your whole life. Um, so if you kill them, uh, they won't come back. Um, another thing, Nissl bodies, N-I-S-S-L. Nissl bodies are the substances that are found in the neurons, which are large and granular. And these granules are essentially just rough ER uh, with rosettes of free ribosomes. Obviously, that makes them very useful for protein synthesis and also they are able to transport proteins once they make them. Um, coming off of the neurosoma or the soma are the dendrites. Uh, the dendrites are the primary site uh, for receiving uh, signals from other neurons or uh, from the environment. Uh, the more dendrites the neuron has, the more information it can receive. Um, they provide precise pathways for this reception and processing of the information. Um, a neuroreceptor is a membrane receptor protein that you'll find on the dendrites, um, and it's activated through a neurotransmitter. Uh, the influx of ions through ion channels opened uh, due to the binding of a neurotransmitter to specific receptors can actually change the membrane potential of a neuron. We'll talk about membrane potentials in a little bit. Um, the axon or the nerve fiber originates from a mound in the neurosoma called the axon hillock right here. Um, the axon is a cylindrical, relatively unbranched for the most of its length. Um, sort of think of it like a wire. Um, the axon collaterals are branches of axon uh, that branch extensively on the distal end. 
Um, it is, this is axon is specialized for rapid conduction of signals to distant points. Um, the axoplasm is the cytoplasm of the axon. The axolemma is the plasma membrane of the axon. There is essentially um, only one axon per a single neuron, though some neurons have none. Uh, the other th next thing to look at is the myelin sheath. Here you see it. Uh, the myelin sheath may enclose the axon, and the myelin sheath allows for quick transmission of signals down the axon. It essentially is an insulator. In between the myelinated regions, you'll see nodes of Ranvier, which are a gap in the myelin sheath of a nerve between adjacent Schwann cells. Schwann cells um, are, are what forms the myelin sheath on this particular neuron. They do that by wrapping their plasma membrane concentrically around the axon. Uh, last thing here, the neurilemma is the cytoplasm and the nuclei of the Schwann cells lying just outside the myelin sheath. So you have the neurilemma and then under that is the myelin sheath. Okay, let's move on to our next, uh, our next slide. Uh, and talk about the structural classifications of different neurons. Most neurons are referred to as multipolar neurons, where they have one axon and multiple dendrites. Um, this, most of these neurons are in the central nervous system. Uh, then you could have bipolar neurons, where you have one axon and only one dendrite, so two poles. Uh, you'll find these in the olfactory cells in the nose, in the retina of the eye, and in the inner ear. And then you could have a unipolar neuron with only a single process leading away from the neurosoma. Uh, you'll find these in the sensory cells in the skin and organs to the spinal cord. Uh, then the anaxonic neurons have many dendrites but no axon. You'll find them in the retina, the brain, and in the adrenal glands. Here's what they look like. Uh, multipolar, multipolar neurons in the top left, a unipolar um, to the right, bottom left, uh, bipolar neurons in the bottom right, and axonic neurons. Okay, now we will talk about neuroglia. We've just been talking about neurons, and there are about a trillion, or 10 to the 12th, that is a lot of zeros, um, neurons in your body. That is 10 times as many stars than there are in our galaxy. Pretty incre incredible. But the glial cells actually outnumber the neurons at least 10 to 1. So that's even more incredible. The glial cells function to protect the neurons and help the neurons function. There are six kinds of neuroglia, each with a unique function, and four of them only occur in the central nervous system. Okay, let's talk about the neuroglia cells here. Uh, there are four types of glial cells that occur in the central nervous system. The oligodendrocytes, the ependymal cells, the microglia, and the astrocytes. Oligodendrocytes uh, form the myelin sheaths in the central nervous system. So it's important to remember that um, the Schwann cells are the, what forms the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. Again, myelin is helping to speed signal conductions. Ependymal cells line the internal cavities of the brain and they secrete and circulate cerebrospinal fluid. Um, it re they resemble cuboidal epithelium that has cilial, cilia on the apical surface, but there is no basement membrane for these guys and they are not epithelial cells. Uh, cerebrospinal fluid bathes and fills the cavities of the central nervous system. The microglia are small macrophages, meaning that they can wander through the central nervous system looking for debris and damage in order to get rid of it. Uh, they develop from white blood cells, unsurprisingly, and they become concentrated in when, the, when there's areas of damage. Okay, uh, the last is the astrocytes. Uh, they're the most abundant glial cells in the central nervous system. They cover the brain surface in most of the non-synaptic regions of neurons. A synapse is the space between two neurons. Um, they have many diverse functions. They form a supportive framework. They have extensions that contact blood capillaries and stimulate them to form a seal called the blood-brain barrier. They monitor neuron activity and regulate blood flow to match metabolic need. 
They convert glucose to lactate and supply this to the neurons. They secrete nerve growth factor. They communicate electrically with other neurons. And then astrocytosis or sclerosis, when a neuron is damaged, astrocytes form hardened scar tissue and fill in the space, okay? Here is what they look like. So here is an astrocyte. You can see that it makes that sort of matrix looking like thing. The ependymal cells here, the microglia, and an oligodendrocyte. Okay, now two types of microglial cells occur in the peripheral nervous system. Schwann cells, remember Schwann cells are the cells that uh, envelop the nerve fibers with the myelin sheath in the peripheral nervous system. Uh, they assist in the regeneration of damaged fibers as well. And then the satellite cells surround the neurosomas in the ganglia of the peripheral nervous system. They provide electrical insulation around the neurosoma, and they regulate the chemical environment of the neurons. Okay, let's talk a little bit about myelin sheath. The myelin sheath is an insulation around a nerve fiber formed by oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system and Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. It consists of the plasma membrane of glial cells, which is about 20% protein and 80% lipids. Um, myelination is just the production of the myelin sheath. It begins at week 14 of fetal development, and it proceeds rapidly during infancy. It's completed in late adolescence, and really it's important that dietary fat is consumed so that the central nervous system can develop properly. In the peripheral nervous system, Schwann cells spiral repeatedly around a single nerve fiber. It lays down as many as 100 layers of membrane. Uh, there's no cytoplasm between the membranes. And again, that neural lemma is the thick outermost coil of myelin sheath. It contains the nucleus and most of the cytoplasm. Uh, external to the neural lemma is the basal lamina and a thin layer of fibrous connective tissue called the endonerium. Okay, that's going to be the stop of our first video for this chapter, chapter 12. I'll see you in the next chapter and uh, well, the next video of this chapter.